Welcome to all. Uh, I will start over the moderator. This is Shamika Sirimani, director of the Division of Technology or Logistic, will come later. And uh, allow me to welcome all the audience, all the participants, the panelists we're going to have today, as you can see on your slide. And it's a great pleasure to have this uh, large number of participants joining us. And uh, without waiting, allow me to give the floor to our Acting Secretary General of FUNCTAD, Madame Isabel Durand. The floor is yours, please. Thank you, Mark. You are hearing me well? Yes, very good. Thank you. Perfect. Go ahead. So, uh, first of all, uh, welcome to all of you. And it's a pleasure for me to launch the Trade for Trade special course on building port resilience against pandemics, especially for me as former Minister of Transport, ports, train, containers are staying close to my heart, uh, probably forever. So uh, ship, ships and by extension seaports handled 80% by volume of global imports and exports. This merchandise trade is essential not only to deliver to people basic needs, but also for maintaining and expanding significant employment in manufacturing, facilitating international trade and sustaining the global economy. The COVID-19 pandemic has been responsible for millions of deaths across the world. The pandemic has also posed a serious threat to global port operation and port communities. However, it is encouraging, especially in these dark times, to note that the maritime sector and port industry have responded swiftly and effectively to the challenges posed by the coronavirus pandemic. We gained insight into some of this measure during UNCTAD's pilot course for building port resilience against pandemics that was attended by 132 participants from 15 countries. The course discussed some of the actions uh, taken by ports to combat the COVID-19 related threats to their operations while protecting the health and safety of their personnel, ships crews and other essential workers in the port community. And I would like to share two examples from ports which share their experiences through Train for Trades platform, which demonstrate how ports adapted their operations and procedures to ensure continuity of trade in a safe and secure environment. The first example draws from the experience in Nigeria. The Nigerian ports authorities secured government approval to carry on essential port services. Special passes were issued to essential port workers. All non-essential workers worked from home. Key dock workers were, divi were divided into shifts A, B, and C to ensure an infected work would not transmit outside his or her shift. And shared equipment was routinely disinfected. Such measure helped to contain the impact of infection among workers. The second example is Malaysia. And in Malaysia, we saw a different approach. The nationwide lockdown decided in Malaysia did not affect cargo movement between Malaysia and Singapore. No restrictions were in place at police red roadblocks for lorries moving between ports and warehouses or between factories and customers between Malaysia and Singapore. A free commercial zones policy maintained free flow of cargo between the specified zone in the two countries. It gives a precise and ordered view of the different aspects to be considered by a port organization in a pandemic situation. And this special course is addressed to all actors involved in international trade, especially those involved with port operations. The course has been developed with the general support of the United Nations Development Account and Irish Aid, as well as the port partner from Valencia in Spain. And I would like to thank Michael and Aurora uh, to the permanent support from their country and uh, their presence and participation today. The next course will be delivered in English starting 28th of June uh, and is open to, to all port communities around the world. To date, already 500 participants from 83 countries have been registered to the course. And I am pleased to announce that the course will be offered in French and in Spanish later this year. Je suis donc très content de pouvoir annoncer que le cours sera donné en français un peu plus tard dans l'année, mais comme placé, annoncer que le cours se impartira en espagnol à finales de este año. 
In closing, countries can benefit from gaining insights from sharing experiences and best practices. We believe that this course will lead to the development of a set of common recommendations to mitigate impacts of the current COVID-19 and future pandemics in port communities around the world. The policy advice will serve as a valuable contribution to the international community and will feed into the deliberations of UNCTAD 15 ministerial conference to be held in October. So we look forward to a fruitful exchange on the importance of keeping supply chains open and allowing maritime trade to continue. I thank you. Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yes, very good, Shamika. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I, I just disappeared in the virtual Harry <laughs> Potter world, but I'm back now. Uh, so thank you, Isabel, very much for your insightful remarks and you really set the stage for us to go forward. And now uh, let me invite uh, Ambassador of Ireland, His Excellency Michael Gaffey. And, uh, you know, Ambassador, you have been a, a champion for Train for Trade program for a very long period of time since the doubling declaration. In fact, in 20, 2007, I'm very happy to have you here. So you have the floor. Thank you very much, Jamaica. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, very well. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you to the assistant, uh, uh, to the acting secretary general. I am really pleased to be here and honored uh, to be here with such a distinguished uh, group of panelists. You know, it's exactly two years since the Trade and Development Board of UNCTAD approved Barbados as the host for UNCTAD 15. And it's a choice that was particularly important given the message that Barbados has to share as a small island developing state facing massive and present risks from climate change. And as Prime Minister Motley of Barbados said yesterday at the Trade and Development Board, the two intervening years have felt like a lifetime. The ongoing pandemic has shown up the inadequacy of much of our understanding of and approach to risk. UNCTAD 15 will take place virtually but it still has a vital agenda and from it must come a transformative message on the role of UNCTAD in building resilience and addressing vulnerability and the impact on trade and development of climate change and the risk of pandemics. The response to this course seems to have been phenomenal and I suppose this should not be surprising. Ports are our gateways to and windows on the world, guarantors of our interconnectedness even in this digital age. As Isabel stated, some 80% of global trade is transported by commercial shipping, including many vital medical supplies. Our societies depend on the resilience of our ports. And this is certainly the case in Ireland, a small island state with an open economy whose prosperity depends on our ability to trade externally. We rely heavily on maritime transport with 90% of all our traded uh, goods and some 10% of passengers transported by sea. Over the past 15 months, the sector has faced a double interlocking challenge. The, the restrictions on transport and, and grounding of flights, the fact that we don't have uh, direct road or rail links from our island to the rest of Europe, and the impact of Brexit. Just 20 years into the 21st century, we have seen with great clarity the critical role of maritime transport to virtually every sector of Irish society. Throughout the pandemic, the government worked to facilitate maritime transport, adapting to health advice and restrictions, recognizing port and shipping crews as essential workers, extending certifications and putting in place agreed protocols with the port and shipping sector for crew and passengers. And our double challenge, as I mentioned, has highlighted the risk of over-reliance on some routes into, one, into and out of just one port. We have had to address that. Strong and resilient ports and shipping are vital for Ireland's connectivity and to ensure supply chains at times of external shock, such as pandemic, international recession, or for instance, semi unexpected events, such as uh, Brexit, which is changing trading and maritime transport pattern patterns for Ireland quite significantly. So shipping is a global industry and global solutions are needed for safe, secure and sustainable transport. Governments need to prioritize maritime transport within the overall supply chain and review policy frameworks to facilitate the growth and development of the port and shipping sector to meet the interlinked demands of connectivity, economic growth 
and the environment. This UNCTAD course is critically relevant, a critically relevant response to the dark challenges exposed for all of us over the past 15 months. The way in which the pandemic has developed and the unpredictability of much of its social and economic impact reveal to us that there is no normal to return to in any sector when it ends. And when it ends, we know viscerally now what science has told us for many years, it will not be the last or necessarily the worst pandemic to face, to confront humanity. Ireland, Shamika, as you said, is very pleased to have supported the Train for Trade port management programme since the English speaking network was established in 2007. We have engaged and we have learned from the ports we have worked with. And it also has helped us in Ireland build a network on our own island, engaging ports right across the island in two jurisdictions. The programme provides clear evidence of the value of UNCTAD in building global networks to address vulnerability. And I commend the Train for Trade team for bringing port communities together since the start of the pandemic, for quickly collecting and sharing information on mitigation measures and protocols, and now for launching this course. UNCTAD has responded to requests from ports for such an initiative and has ensured it is open to all. I am confident that this course will contribute real substance to the elevated aim of the Bridgetown Covenant, moving from vulnerabilities and inequalities to prosperity for all. And I just want to conclude by thanking the UNCTAD team who have put together such a necessary event with a wide range of port experts and authorities, including our friends from Valencia, Buenos Aires and Barbados. We will not, as we had hoped, now physically make it to Barbados for UNCTAD 15 in October. But we have a chance in this first major global conference, as we begin to emerge from the pandemic, to work on a vision for our economies and societies which will enable us to do so before long in a safe and sustainable way, either as tourists or as business people. And we know that it will not be possible without a clear recognition of the centrality of our ports to the health and welfare of our societies. So thank you very much for the invitation to this event and good luck to everyone with the course. Thank you, Ambassador, for your very kind words on uh... Ambassador, we cannot hear you. I think you are muted. Yes, I'm muted, but I have finished. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your kind words about the port program. And as you said, I think the value of the port program is that we have managed to bring the communities of ports together to talk to each other and share lessons and, uh, and best practices. And that's how it worked to create this uh, uh, program. We brought the port communities together to create this new uh, module. So now it is my great pleasure uh, to, uh, to invite the ambassador of Spain, Ms. Aurora Diaz Rato Ruelta to take the floor. The government of Spain has been a strong supporter of the Train for Trade program for many, many years with MOUs, with uh, Puertos del Estado and port authorities of Guion and Valencia. And these are very, very valued uh, networks for us. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you so much. It's, um, dear friends, it's a great pleasure to join you in the launch of this important and very timely training program with an 8,000 kilometers coastline in proximity to one of the most important maritime routes of the world, Spain is a key strategic area and a logistic platform in Southern Europe. Our logistic sector thrived and is one of the most important ones in Europe. In particular, Spanish ports maintain 35,000 direct jobs and 100,000 indirect jobs, which enable nearly 60,000 of our exports uh, and 85% of them of our imports to get into our country. It is also timely because the COVID pandemic has allowed to note that ports are infrastructures with which essential services are offered, through which supplies to the population and exports are ensured under any possible circumstances, including in emergency situations, in a context of full globalization, not only of trade, but as we have seen, also of epidemics. This compels us to strengthen the role on several fronts. First of all, from an operational dimension. It is clear that the ports have to anticipate the unfolding of scenarios such as pandemics, incorporating such a scenario in its resilience and emergency strategies. 
ensuring the necessary resources to face such situation and conducting simulations. In Spain, the purchase of the first package of 8 million masks in March 2020 was conducted by the Central Port Authority and distributed to all transport and logistics stakeholders, including the ports. This was a success story of anticipating needs and of collaboration between different public administrations, including with the department responsible for monitoring health situations abroad, and this was only the beginning. In this sense, I would like to recognize the excellent coordination work carried out by our national border inspection authorities, coordinated by each port authority at the local level and by the national uh, Spanish port authority at the national level. All of them were working uninterruptedly during the worst moment of the pandemic, which were very bad, during and uh, between the months of March and May of last year. Likewise, this year, uh, during the 2021, Spanish ports are being the main national infrastructures that are helping in the recovery of international trade, both exports and imports. As is well known, the way out of the 2008 economic crisis took place thanks to the increase of our exports and the presence of our products in international markets. And in this new crisis, there is no doubt that our recovery will be through the growth of our international trade in which Spanish ports will play a key role. On a short-term economic outlook front, it's also a point to be signaled. In line with extension of the US state aid temporary framework and the modification of EU regulation 352, it was also very important to take advantage of the Spanish port's robust um, financial situation to help mitigate the economic impact of the pandemic in the port's business ecosystem. In Spain, the dominant management model is the landlord one in which private companies are the ones in charge of supplying the port services. Therefore, our piece of advice for port authorities able to do so would be to temporarily assist the port's business community in situations of crisis without, of course, distorting transport markets by revisiting applicable fees. And then with a longer term structural perspective, as a lever of economic development and in line with current stimuli packages to recover aggregate demand, ports can play a role in boosting so infrastructure investment demand, not only or necessarily to enhance capacity, but also to improve environmental sustainability, safety, digitalization, and innovation. Being at the center of global value chains, ports can be an important driver for a better and greener economic recovery. As UNCTAD's climate change impacts and adaptation for coastal uh, transport infrastructure report says, ports will be particularly affected by climate variability and change, particularly in view of the location in coastal zones, low-lying areas, and deltas. Projected increases in the means and extreme sea levels will cause permanent and or recurring marine flooding of seafoods. Increases in mean temperatures and the frequency or duration of heat waves will pose substantial challenges such as damages to port pave areas and navigational equipment. Extreme winds and waves can also be catastrophic as they can cause coastal erosion, port coastal defense over topping and flooding, infrastructure failures and operational disruptions. Given the, stra the uh, strategic role of ports and other key coastal transport infrastructure as part of the global trading system and the potential for climate related delays and disruptions across, across global supply chains, enhancing their climate resilience is a matter of strategic economic importance. On the digital digitalization side, I would like to point out the important digitalization process that has already taken in place in Spanish ports in recent years and in a special way, the digitalization of customs procedures that has facilitated that most of the export and import processes can be carried out electronically, being a, main, a benchmark for the modernization of port infrastructures from many countries. This has proved particularly useful all over the world in times of pandemic and lockdowns, such as the ones we recently had to so dearly endure. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you very much for sharing, sharing the stories and lessons from Spain and how you have managed to uh, be on top of uh, this pandemic and to make sure that the ports remain resilient so the ships move, ports open, and the trade flows. I think this is kind of the business of UNCTAD, and thank you so much. And now here, let me... Uh, get the first poll results. I think, Mark, you have... Uh, collected the poll results the, for the first one, where are you from? I think that was the question. So Mark, you want to take the floor and let us know where is everybody coming from and connecting to this session? 
Uh, yes, thank you, Shamika. What we're going to do, we just uh, alongside the, the presentations, we're going to have two polls. And the first one will be launched right now. So it's just to break the ice also with our audience. We have close to 170 people on Zoom and on, on Facebook. I don't have the figures, but we have some there. So now the panelists, uh, are, you're not answering. <laughs> you will see it, it's not activated, but it will be for audience so that we just see, uh, we engage with them. Uh, we have a little idea of the numbers, but uh, let's see that. And also remind the participants, uh, I, I know some of you, you know the program well, feel free to use the chat or Q and A, a, and a function on Zoom to ask questions. And from the Facebook uh, live UNCTAD, you can also uh, put your questions there and uh, the team behind the scene will, will work on that. Over to you, Shamika. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So I'm waiting to see the map full of uh, color. Uh, so now let me turn to uh, Mr. David Jean-Marie, CEO of Barbados a Port uh, Incorporated. And it is a real honor to have Barbados represented in this UNCTAD 15 pre-event, David, because it is going to be a Barbados event and we want to hear from you from the ports of Barbados. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Excellencies, Acting General Secret Secretary General of UNCTAD, distinguished delegates, colleagues, friends, good morning, good afternoon, wherever in the world you are. It's such an honor for me to be here today to share our COVID-19 experience. The Port of Bridgetown is Barbados' premier gateway to international commerce. It serves as a major economic driver, supporting the prosperity of hundreds of businesses in all sectors, handling more than 90% of the nation's trade and all its cruise ship operations. The onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020 not only put our health and safety practices to the test, but threatened to disrupt Barbados' lifeline for the importation of food, medical supplies, nearly all of the island's imports for the productive sectors of foreign exchange earnings generated from exports. Prior to the first reported Barbados case on March 17, 2020, a wide-scale COVID-19 sensitization and awareness campaign was launched for the entire port community under the guidance of the Ministry of Health and Wellness. As an essential service company, we knew the importance of maintaining cargo flows. But more than that, we knew that we could only do it if we safeguarded the health of our employees. Ever since then, our ability to adapt and work against the odds has been uniquely tested. We remain determined, however, not only to survive this disruption to our lives, but to emerge a more resilient organization. COVID-19 has taught us many valuable lessons, some applicable not only for today, but well into the future. Lesson number one, COVID-19 has taught us to put people first. Our primary interest has always been to the safety of our team. As the spread of the disease forced the shutdown of the country, and the implementation of emergency management protocols by government, the port as an essential service provider had to adapt its work arrangements and make systematic adjustments to reduce the risk of transmission, all while ensuring the delivery of essential cargo. It was imperative that we shifted the corporate culture towards being more considerate and health conscious. Some of the measures included reconfiguration of workspaces to ensure social distancing, work from home arrangements where feasible, rotational shift arrangements for administrative staff, operational staff release and completion of tasks, identification, release and paid leave for high-risk employees, restricted entry and movement of non-essential personnel through the port, suspended delivery of non-essential cargo. As public health conditions change rapidly and community spread increase, some of our employees eventually contracted the virus. Recognizing that a positive COVID-19 test result is for an individual employee or colleague is by its nature distressing and understanding the equally agonizing weight for a result of a test, we made constant available through our human resources department to help our employees navigate living and working through the impact of COVID-19. We have also been encouraging our employees to take the vaccine. Approximately one third of staff so far have been fully vaccinated since we started in February this year. Our work life is now considerably different to what it used to be the norm. The sobering message in all 
that has happened is that we all need to be all in at all times on our strict health and safety protocols, both on and off port. We have to hold ourselves accountable for keeping our port and our loved ones safe. Lesson number two, embrace course correction. It's inevitable. Sometimes the best laid plans will be derailed by unexpected life-changing events. In this case, a global pandemic. COVID-19 forced us to take a complete relook at our playbook. Our emergency management response plan and our crisis communications plan were reinforced to shore up our response against the threat of infectious diseases. New protocols were developed and instituted for cruise and cargo operations, as well as for the servicing of yachts in line with the Ministry of Health and Wellness and International Maritime Organization requirements. Friendly employees in the Marine Services and Terminal Operations Units were trained in best practice protocols and offered guidance in the proper use of PPE and operations during berthing, mooring, unmooring, and working of vessels. Our PPE equipment policy was re-examined to ensure reduction and elimination of any risk posed. When the suspension of cruising was announced, the major challenge for many of the vessels at sea was to find in just a few days a suitable port where they could repatriate passengers and crew and also bunker fuel, load provisions, and offload base. The port of Bridgetown was one of the few ports in the Caribbean, indeed the world, which remained open to vessels throughout the pandemic and that could offer the services and facilities the vessels required. As a home port and hub for several major cruise lines, Barbados has all the requisite elements in place to facilitate high volume passenger and luggage transfers efficiently between the seaport and the airport including ground transportation, airlift, and security screening. The government of Barbados therefore made the decision to offer safe harbor to vessels during what mushroomed into a humanitarian crisis. Working through the final details of new repatriation protocols to make this happen, mandated dramatically increased collaboration across agencies, government ministries of health, tourism, and maritime affairs, the Customs and Immigration Departments, the Granley Adams International Airport, local port agents, as well as private sector agencies involved in cruise and ground transportation. It was this united approach that enabled the Port of Bridgetown and Barbados to serve as a proverbial port in the storm at the height of the pandemic, hosting up to 36 vessels and repatriating approximately 21,000 passengers and crew to their home countries. For some of those cruise lines which requested extended stays in Barbados until they could return to their respective home ports, that stay ended only in May last month. At peak, there were 15 vessels in layup. Throughout the stay in Barbados waters, the port continued to provide operational support. In addition, Barbados fulfilled its obligations under the International Health Regulations 2007 to render medical care to anyone who became ill on board a cruise ship which home ports here. While the ships were berthed in port or anchored offshore, mandatory reporting requirements were implemented for vessels including frequent updates from all ships on the health status of the crew members on board. When persons disembarked for repatriation, an exclusive zone was secured in port where all logistics and boarding of ground transportation are facilitated. The Royal Barbados Police Force and the Barbados Defense Force provided logistical and ground transportation support for repatriation operations, moving persons directly from the seaport to the airport in a sterile convoy. Throughout the exercise, personal contact was minimized and strict social distancing observed. Our cruise business traditionally represents approximately 22% of annual port revenues. But for the wider community of transport service providers, retailers, attractions, restaurants, and ancillary tourism services, it represents a far greater percentage of earnings. It is therefore economically vital that an adaptive form of cruising returns to our region. Over the past several weeks, we have been working doubly hard with our cruise line partners and the Ministry of Health and Wellness to ensure the port of Bridgetown and Barbados is ready for the resumption of cruise business. BPI also supported the America's Cruise Task Force in developing guidelines to assist destinations in developing their own protocols for cruise resumption. We have instituted the requisite protocols to ensure vessel operations and operation spaces are safe and for risk to health and welcome our first commercial cruise since March 2020 on June 7th, 2021. And the third voyage was only yesterday. We have reinforced the infrastructure at our home port terminal 
and main gate with enhanced facilities for passenger flow, screening, testing, as well as quarantine. Shortly, we'll be completing the installation of thermal scanners at strategic points, all in the bid to welcome future travelers in a post-COVID environment. And this brings us to lesson number three. Invest in technology and digital solutions. Barbados borders remain open during two periods of national lockdown, accelerating our need to provide secure, reliable, and efficient service with safety in mind. As the pandemic triggered restrictions and disruptions across ports, shipping and supply chains, we at the Port of Bridgetown escalated plans for the development of digital solutions. Recognizing that social distancing, health and hygiene protocols will likely remain in place for the foreseeable future, touch less service delivery and investments in digital technology have proven to be the golden bridge to business continuity. Our first move to virtual business was the shift to online platforms like Zoom, WebEx and Microsoft Teams to facilitate meetings and workshops. The manual process for outward vessel clearances was abandoned and an electronic vessel clearances platform developed to allow relevant personnel to grant or deny permission for vessels to arrive or depart. All vessel clearances and processing are now facilitated electronically. In an effort to further minimize personal contact, the port created an electronic payment platform and instituted an electronic appointment system for cargo collection. The electronic payment platform allows for the payment of commercial charges where the appointment system ensures cargo is processed and delivered and the exports are facilitated in an efficient and timely manner. The appointment system further facilitates joint cargo inspections to be undertaken by the customs, port health authorities and other regulatory agencies, thereby reducing time spent in facilitating cargo clearance. Entry into the port for cargo collection and delivery continues via, by appointment and approximately 50% of commercial cargo payments, the BPI, are now made via our online portal. Lesson number four, lean into your customers. Throughout the two lockdown periods, when deliveries restricted to essential cargo and exports, we had a significant backlog of containers and LCL cargo building up in the port. On reopening to full service, we were able to reduce these backlogs within a matter of weeks and achieve a reduction in our dwell time for containers to below six days. How did we do that? by leaning into and listening to our customers and actively assisting them in clearing cargo. It is common to hear that one needs to be customer-centric or focused. We do the usual surveys to measure satisfaction and get feedback. We, however, move beyond that and establish teams to reach out to customers, particularly those who had cargo in port for excessively lengthy periods to better understand the challenges they were experiencing in clearing cargo and work with them to get over the hurdles. We set up a committee of stakeholders to examine port performance and productivity and enhance our customer feedback portal to be more responsive. We no longer wait on customers to come with complaints. We try to get to them first when we see a slowdown in the efficiency levels. And finally, lesson number five, diversify. The COVID-19 pandemic had a serious impact on port performance. At the end of the just concluded fiscal year, March, 31st, 2021, the Port of Bridgetown had, had handled 1.1 million tons of cargo, down from 1.3 million tons the previous year. The number of 20 foot containers declined from 99,000 to just under 83,000. With the suspension of commercial cruising, 906 car vessels called were, were recorded as compared to 1,300 at the end of March, 2020. Cruise passenger numbers peaked at 850,000 passengers and last year stood at zero. The reduced traffic has, of course, resulted in reduced revenues. We have therefore had to seriously consider the need to adopt new activities beyond our core crews and cargo business. As a result, our new five-year business plan has therefore incorporated new business ventures, which could contribute to the recovery of the economic activity on which the port depends, that is international trade, tourism, logistics, manufacturing, construction, etc. Some of the projects under consideration include Expansion of the Shell Draft Marina for yachts and pleasure craft, establishment of a boat repair facility, commercialization of our lighthouses, development of bulk handling capacities in keeping with the need of the country to import certain bulk materials for construction, including cement and a range of aggregates, generation of 100% of our needs through expansion of photovoltaic systems, waste to energy incineration facilities, and development of shore power to vessels using surplus green energy development of a port community system, and last and by no means 
the development of logistics facilities for cargo and change the way we do business in our brick well and container operations. We are increasingly collaborating with external agencies and exploring the development of new trade lanes, researching new markets for export and position the port to be a transshipment hub for South American and African markets. With, within the global transportation system, seaports are expected to guarantee the sustainability of the population, provide reliable connectivity, and facilitate the efficient distribution of supplies. That expectation increases even more so during these crises. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we at the Port of Bridgetown escalated development plans to ensure our own business continuity, and that has positioned us better than before. We have been fundamentally improving and reinvigorating the business to respond to new technologies, shifting customer expectations, and a continuously changing environment. Accelerating the pace of change, prioritizing innovation and strategic flexibility in line with our long-term vision, has made us more resilient. That resilience could only have come having worked through the difficult circumstances of the pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Thank you very much, David, uh, for giving us very practical steps that you have undertaken in Barbados to protect your ports and to you know, keep the ship's goods moving and also passengers, uh, cruise sh ships moving. And thank you very much. And you also mentioned how important the digitalization was in this endeavor. Just want to say that, you know, as you know, Asikuda uh, is working with the customs authorities. Uh, and we also have done a lot of work during this period of making sure that the customs is ready uh, <clears throat> to, to in this endeavor of trade facilitation. So please say hello to the customs DG, Owen Smith from me. And now I think, Mark, shall we put the uh, poll results out and may and then launch the second poll? I think maybe this is the time. Yes, absolutely. So thank you again for participants. I think we have uh, 169 uh, connected and uh, nearly 140 voted, so 85% of votes, which is quite high. And you could see uh, Asia is 58%. Uh, now for Australia and Oceania, we have to take into consideration the jet lag. Uh, this is one of the value of doing everything online is that you cannot compress time. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to see at least we have 2% of representatives and then you're up 15%. So th this tells you a little bit of, of the split of, of what we have. And we're going to close this one and open up the next uh, poll uh, relating to this was a very important element connected to SDG3. We realized when we built this call, the staff well-being and measures taken by your own entity are of absolute uh, importance. So please share your, your thoughts about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please, can I also invite you to uh, put your key, uh, queries in the Q&A slot? As you can see, I think this is a very rare, a rare opportunity to hear really the CEO of, of a port discussing what steps they took during the pandemic to, to, you know, to build resilience. In their, in their businesses. So now let me turn to the president of the Port Authority of Valencia, Mr. Aurelio Martinez. And we are extremely grateful to the Valencia Port Foundation for the contribution to the development of this course and also being with us you know, for a very long time in our, uh, our port network, uh, 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 the program. So Aurelio, you have the floor. Thank you, Samika. Okay, uh, wait a minute. Madam Acting Secretary General of the UNTAC, Madam Ambassador Diaz Rato, Ambassador Gaffey, representative of the Port of Buenos Aires and Barbados, members of the UNTAC, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank to the UNTAC for inviting me to the take part in this session, this very interesting session. The Port Authority of Valencia has been activity, actively involved in train for trade program for two decades now, playing a central role in development of the world of Spanish speaking ports while still collaborating closely with other networks across the five continents. There is no doubt that so far in this and in other areas of the collaboration, the experience has been the fruits we want. Please allow me to thank the program team headed by Mark Asaf. Thank you, Mark, for the excellent work 
uh, they had been doing. It's truly gratifying to share objectives and experience with professionals like them. The last year and a half has changed our lives radically, but it has also shown us our capacity for resilience, endurance, and ability to overcome. Perhaps the most important thing about the pandemic is the need to draw some conclusion that will help us for the future. I can identify at least 12 important lessons. Be sure I will be very, very short, <laughs> don't worry. One, ports and the logistic chains are key to tackling the stream situations, has been demonstrated by the crisis and the strategic role ports have played all over the world, not in Valencia, not in Europe, in America, all over the world. And the human team, with their commitment and dedication, had been crucial in the results achieved. Two, the world has become so globalized that an interruption in one country is immediately exported to the rest. We have seen recently this with the pandemia, the Suez Canal blockage, the poor congestions, the present poor congestions, the container shortages, the Yantian crisis, and so on. Three, that and recovery program must be very well planned to avoid the resulting collapses and congestions in the infrastructure distorting markets to extremes such as those we see today. Four, the logistics chain is rigid in the short term, and a blockage in any tier of the chain immediately affects the rest. Five, the negative impacts are not homogeneous. There are clear spatial imbalance. They affect the weakest links in the trade flows more acutely. These include less developed countries and those isolated from major shipping routes. Six, similarly, the cost and benefits of critical situation are not distributed equally throughout the logistic chains. For example, a shipping company is not affected the same way a carrier is. Seven, this unequal impact is also felt along large corporation with low contracts as a, a, a small and medium corporation. The spread open between contract rates and export rates is unsustainable. Eight, the COVID, the pandemic, and especially the various resulting crises pose a serious risk of macroeconomic imbalance and in trade flows, some temporary, but many of them more lasting. This includes, for example, the rise in inflation, you can see in the industrial countries, for example, the industrial relocation in certain sectors, the disruption of value chain flow, disguises protections, high freight rates sustained over time will damage trade in low value at goods and so on. The potential impact of this disruption of trade flows on the economic growth of the less developed country is significant and should be studied and considered in depth. Nine, protectionism is starting to emerge in the services sector. We can see this, for example, in the use of tunics as a means of placing pressure on countries. Ten, the oligopolization of certain parts of the logistics chain is exacerbating existing imbalance with the resulting impact on the bottom lines. Eleven, comprehensive traffic security and digitalization of online control processes will prove key going forward. And finally, 12, a recurrence of these events is highly likely, and we need to be prepared. In this context, the UNTA has developed a special course, Building Port Resilience Against Pandemics. The Port Authority of Valencia and Valencia Port Foundation have had the opportunity to participate to participate by preparing some materials based on our recent experience with, among others, the following objectives. To foster a trade policy geared towards economic development, to promote digital solution and innovation, to create networks of sustainable knowledge, etc. At the start of the year, we delivered the first pilot course, which has resounding success in participation. It's my hope that this UNTAC initiative through the dissemination of knowledge and best practices helps port to become drivers on of the relaunching of trade and to contribute to the global economic recovery as rapidly as possible. 
look into the future, as I have already indicated, it may still be too early to determine the full impact of the pandemic on global trade and economy. The return to normality will take time. And this new normality is likely differ from what we expect or what we knew before the pandemic. In any case, this crisis could be an opportunity to achieve a more sustainable and inclusive development contributing to sustainable develop development goals. In this respect, the Port Authority of Valencia is developing strategies that take this charge change into account, the strengthening aspect like security, quality of life, and sustainability. This challenge, these goals for the future can only be met, I'm sure you will all agree, if all stakeholders, private agents, national and international institutions work together in the same directions. Thank you very much and take care. This, that is more important. Thank you, Aurelio. And I, I am very happy that you were working with us in building, developing this uh, course. And as you showed that there are, it's not just uh, what is happening at ports, but when the ports are blocked up, when the ships don't move, there are huge macroeconomic impacts as you have shown the scarcity of essential goods, you know, stoppage in industries. We have seen the fre freight rates rising and inflation picking up and there is no end to it. And so this, as you can see, is an extremely important endeavor to make uh, uh, ports open and ships moving and the goods moving. And where, where, whenever there is a block, it has huge implications across in, up until the global uh, growth. Thank you so much. So I think, Mark, you are ready with the next poll. And I remember David mentioned that how important to look at the human angle, the staff well-being. And let's see how many are saying this. Yes, thank you, Shamika, and thank you to the audience that voted. As you could see, the majority, 58%, said yes, uh, staff well-being uh, has been addressed in the institution. Now we could see that some are not sure, 32%. So there's still some work to be done, and 10% are saying no. So this is the result. Thank you. Thank you very much. And here, could I please also talk about this, uh, the crew crisis. This is some other thing that Antad is uh, uh, watching. And there you've seen uh, recently there was a, a death on a ship and the ship could not, uh, ship was not allowed to come to many ports that it went to. And this is a real concern. The seafarer uh, uh, situation is also a big concern. And this is something that we are also looking into and working. And we'll be going to the General Assembly to report on the seafarer's predicament uh, at the end of the year. So now let me turn to the last speaker of our, uh, uh, of our panel, Mr. Jose Carlos Mario Beni, and he's the controller, basically the CEO of the Port of Buenos Aires and a beneficiary member from the Spanish speaking network in Latin America and the Caribbean. Mark, I understand that we have a, a video to show. Yes, that is correct. We're gonna play the video he is addressing in Spanish and we have the subtitle in English. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hola, buenos días. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Gracias por estar acá, aunque sea de manera virtual. Desde Buenos Aires es realmente un gusto poder participar de este nuevo curso de la UNTAD. Y a modo de introducción me gustaría leerle algunas palabras que he preparado para esta ocasión. Eh, la pandemia del COVID tomó por sorpresa a todos, generando una disrupción sobre el desarrollo normal de todas las actividades, incluida nuestra actividad portuaria. En este marco, los puertos en su, el sistema portuario tuvo un rol fundamental como infraestructura logística marítima para sostener el comercio internacional y para garantizar el transporte de bienes y personas pero muchos de ellos relacionados con la sanidad, con la actividad sanitaria o con la actividad médica. El COVID-19 demostró también lo importante que es contar con puertos resilientes. La propagación del virus generó una crisis sanitaria, económica y social a niveles globales e inusitados que interpeló a la comunidad logística y portuaria a responder con rapidez implementando protocolos, medidas de sanidad y seguridad para evitar más contagios. 
En la Administración General de Puertos de Argentina se tomaron todas las recomendaciones y medidas sanitarias dirigidas a la población en general y en especial a la actividad portuaria. Por su parte, el Ministerio de Transporte de la Nación estableció un comité de crisis y elaboró el protocolo del Comité de Crisis de Prevención del COVID en el transporte fluvial, marítimo y lacustre, el cual contiene medidas de prevención y procedimientos de actuación y obliga a todos los puertos a contar con un plan de contingencia COVID que debe ser remitido al Comité para su difusión y público conocimiento. Desde la AGP colaboramos activamente con el Comité y a su vez elaboramos un protocolo de actuación para el control de la propagación del virus, para aplicación tanto en el ámbito de la jurisdicción portuaria como en sus alrededores y una serie de recomendaciones adicionales y complementarias. No quiero dejar de destacar que el rol de los trabajadores y las trabajadoras portuarias es clave en un contexto de crisis sanitaria. Entendemos y reconocemos la importancia de las personas, pues ellos son quienes hacen al puerto y en los tiempos de que vivimos valoramos especialmente su trabajo y los servicios que han prestado y siguen prestando al puerto y al país en general. Por eso desde nuestro rol comprendemos la importancia de brindar todos los elementos de seguridad y los insumos médicos necesarios para garantizarles las mejores condiciones posibles para la realización de su actividad y de colaborar en la prevención del contagio en todo el ámbito comunitario. Desde el inicio del aislamiento social, preventivo y obligatorio, Puerto Buenos Aires se encuentra funcionando con protocolos validados por el Ministerio de Salud, que incluyen, entre otras cosas, el mantenimiento de distancia social, el uso de barbijos, el uso de alcohol frecuente y distintos eh, elementos de protección personal que van más allá de las actividades propias de, del trabajo portuario. Los agentes del servicio médico de nuestro puerto capacitaron al personal asignado a las tareas esenciales sobre todos estos aspectos. Al mismo tiempo destacamos la importancia de unir los esfuerzos de los sectores públicos y privados para erradicar el virus. Brindamos asesoramiento a las terminales y permisionarios en la implementación adecuada de las medidas de sanidad para evitar la propagación del COVID y se montaron unidades de aislamiento preventivo dentro del puerto. En conjunto con las medidas previamente mencionadas, el Puerto de Buenos Aires ha tomado una serie de medidas económicas con la finalidad de proteger toda la actividad. En este sentido, algunas de ellas que se pueden mencionar son, por ejemplo, la bonificación de las tasas general por uso de puerto a los buques y a los pasajeros, las reducciones de cánones de los permisionarios y de las tasas en general por uso de muelle a los buques y servicios específicos de uso de muelles para promover la llegada de cruceros e incentivar el turismo. Para terminar, quisiera destacar nuevamente la importancia que adquiere para todos los puertos contar con el personal comprometido y capacitado para afrontar una crisis sanitaria como la que atravesamos. Es muy valioso contar con cursos que apoyen la implementación de medidas para generar puertos más resilientes. En este sentido, no quería dejar de mencionar y reconocer el trabajo realizado por la UNTAD a través de los programas dictados en beneficio de todos los actores que conforman la actividad. Por eso desde el AGP apoyamos y seguiremos apoyando todos los programas que se implementen desde Naciones Unidas. Muchísimas gracias y deseo el mejor de los éxitos para este curso. Thank you very much. So we have now come to the end of our the, the panel session. So I have a couple of questions uh, the the excellent uh, uh, esteemed panelist So I will just uh, put this to you, and uh, if you can just take about a minute or two to uh, answer. I know it is difficult, but uh, please. So let me start with the two ambassadors. Uh, Ambassador Gaffey, what do you see as, as you go forward? How do you see uh, Ireland collaborating more with other countries in protecting and securing supply chains? Well, thank you. I think. Um... We've had a bit of a wake-up call. We are a small island uh, country. We know we're dependent on trade, but I think what we really understood here was that we were really dependent on, on our ports for our supply chains. Uh, you know, for some emergency uh, PPE equipment, we were able to have special flights coming in in an emergency way. But, but really we had to, I mean, many, many companies as well had to diversify, move away from air to sea uh, transport. 
And it came at exactly the time that we were uh, adapting to Brexit and the United Kingdom leaving the uh, European Union. So we had relied very much on a land bridge uh, across the United uh, Kingdom to the rest of Europe. So we've had to change in a remarkably short time the pattern of our trade and an increased reliance on um, on 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 direct uh, links connectivity with the rest of Europe. And, and just I, I just looked, um, for instance, in a very short time, shipping direct to the continent has increased from uh, 36 uh, lift on lift off and roll on roll off sailings a week in the first quarter of 2020 to well over 60 uh, now. So we our whole our whole pattern of trade is shifting. And for both reasons of the pandemic and of Brexit, we're realizing that we have to use, we, that our ports are really critical to our economy. The port sector learned, like every other sector, on the need to look after uh, its employees and to adapt in the way that our colleague from uh, Barbados has set out so so eloquently. But um, I think you will find uh, in the in the in over the coming period that the people that you in the port training program know so well from Dublin Port, from Belfast Port, from Cork Port, who work so well uh, in, in that ne network, you will see just how their ports are developing, both in terms of infrastructure, but also in terms of their centrality to the economic and social well-being of, uh, of the country. So this, uh, this, this training program actually is something that I'd almost feel like I'd like to sign up for myself. I've learned a lot already today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And you truly showed that, you know, your uh, island was facing uh, some multiple shocks. So it's the, uh, about the building resilience to multiple shocks. So let me now turn to the uh, Ambassador of Spain. Could you please tell us and uh, what do you foresee as national priorities for Spain? Because you are a very big seafaring country. Thank you so much, Jamika. We have all learned a lot about ports this afternoon, I guess. Well, a Santac uh, port industry survey on climate change impacts and adaptation indicates due to their location in low lying coasts and estuaries, ports are inherently exposed to marine and land hydrometeorological hazards controlled by climate variability and change, such as rising mean and extreme sea levels storm waves, extreme winds and heavy precipitation, rubbering floods and droughts and heat waves, you name it. Therefore, climate resilience will have a growing weight in Spain's priorities going forward. And as I said before, ports can play a key role in the current economic recovery by boosting aggregate demand when it's still depressed and the challenges of adaptation to climate change and digitalization will offer an opportunity for making good use of public money in order to build resilience for the future we have the opportunity of responding to short and long-term challenges at the same time. And that's a good moment. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. You know, also talking about the climate change, you know, that's another thing coming our way. So it's, it's a, this is again a multiple shocks and how do we make sure that our critical infrastructure is protected? I think this is a very, very important point. So now for David and Aurelio, you both have a question from our uh, uh, a query posted about digitalization, you both talked about how you, the digitalization helped during uh, the onset of COVID-19. So the question is, what measures did you take? Uh, could you, I know uh, David, you, 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 you uh, talked a bit about that, but could you please take a, a, a minute or two uh, to start talking about what measures, the digitalization measures you put in place and what difficulties that you had in, uh, in deploying these technologies? So let me start with uh, David and then go to Aurelio. David, you have the floor. Right, so we, we worked with our uh, shipping agents and all of our customers to automate the payment systems using the banks, using electronic transfer to pay port charges rather than persons coming into the port, port facility. So we reduced the traffic in, a, in the port, port admin building we made life easier. We reduced the cost of doing of doing business, and rather than persons being on the road traveling to and from the port, they would stay in the offices and transact business, pay the port charges, and only the necessary um, employees, the truckers, for example, would be on the roads. Those are the main areas. We are also in the process of developing a port community system. We, we have a funding arrangement with the Caribbean Development Bank, 
and we're working with the OAS in developing a port community system to make life easier for all stakeholders who are engaged in shipping. Thank you, David. Aurelio, you would like to take the floor? Yeah. Well, uh, I am talking about the, the challenges we need to confront with this pandemic. And probably the most important challenge was, without doubt, to react quickly, safely, and efficiently to a situation that was totally new for, to all of us, of course. No? Uh, with the country in lockdown, the responsibility shown by the port community and the staff of the Port Authority was commendable risking their own health and that their families without abdicating the responsibility at any moment. It's very important to say that. No? We designed and pro improvised and precedent protocols and proceedings for immediate action in conjunction with the health authority and other stakeholders in the logistic chains. We cannot afford to miss the opportunity to learn from this experience. We must share all that we have learned over what have been very difficult months. That's why Valencia Port is participating in Stamina, the European innovation project that aims to provide technological tools to support decision making in preparing for and managing such pandemic crisis in collaboration with other administration, including the local policy force and the Red Cross. This way, we will have the opportunity to improve our preparedness, action, and response to risk situations, and to incorporate predictive models for decision making in port system. I think it's the best, the best uh, results of all this very long and very hard process we have been living in the last months. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aurelio, uh, for bringing this uh, human angle of this uh, crisis to the fore. We can never, you know, we should never uh, forget uh, yeah. that. So uh, everyone, so we have now come to the end of this uh, uh, session. So uh, let me have a, give a very big thank you to all of the great panelists. And we really did learn a lot from you. And uh, I think this uh, beginning of our course on building port resilience against pandemics uh, has been uh, greatly enriched by this opening uh, uh, session. And for the next five weeks, the course will be open. There will be a lot of discussions and sharing country experiences. And we have an online session. We have a 450 participants from 80 plus countries. We didn't expect it to be that big. But that's what happened because I think this is an extremely important uh, topic and people are still grappling. This COVID-19 has not gone anywhere. It, we are still grappling with, uh, you know, again and again, different surges. So we will be living in this situation for a while. So I'm very happy to say that 600 participants from 90 countries, I think, yeah, 90 countries now, uh, and 37% are women. And this is also an important point because in, in the business of logistics, it's, it's a bit of a man's world. So we would very much uh, appreciate women being uh, in, in the course. So just want to say that the course is still open for you to uh, uh, register. So please, uh, um, you know, take the word out and get everybody registered. So let me now uh, close by saying that I'm also thankful to our member states this, uh, that are negotiating towards the UNCTAD 15 document. And this is our quadrennial uh, uh, meeting. It's UNCTAD 15 ministerial meeting. It's a quadrennial meeting. And we will get our mandates in October. And I see the draft negotiation text very much appreciates the work that we do in the division in protecting supply chains, keeping uh, uh, borders open, keeping ports open, ships moving, and the international trade flowing. So just want to also thank the member, member states of UNCTAD of taking this uh, issue as a serious uh, concern and reflecting in your draft negotiation text. So having said that, and let me thank you all of you, the, our great panelists and everybody joining on Zoom and also on Facebook. And Mark, thank you very much for the great work you do. And uh, you know, bon courage for the next five weeks that you have the course. Thank you, everyone. So we come to the end of this session. Bye-bye.